Hey everybody, Eric Chesson, founder of Autism Fitness, leading the movement for movement here. And this is a very special edition of not just Tuesday Training, but an awesome interview with my friend and one of the creators of the first work app, which we're going to get into. This is going to be a good one. You don't want to miss it. But first, before we get into anything else, well, I'm going to introduce my friend Patrick Vega. And of course, like, subscribe, and share this. This is going to be a good one. Other people are going to want to see it aside from you. So be generous with it. Anyway, uh, Patrick uh, agreed to, to jump on with me today because one of the biggest questions that that I get um, from, from parents, from professionals alike, in the realm of fitness for the autism and neurodivergent population is what about motivation? What about reinforcement? What do we use? What works? Um, I have, I, Patrick, I can't tell you how many emails uh, or interactions I've had uh, that start with um, my teenager, my adult is unmotivated to exercise. And of course, that's something that we have to, to use a very overused phrase at this point, something we have to unpack because that question or statement begets much more questions. Um, but that's something that I want to get into. So today, um, as a rundown of what we're going to be talking about is I, I wanted to uh, introduce Patrick to to my audience, because I, I love what you're doing with the First Work app. Um, but also the, the perspective of how fitness can take someone into this pathway of, of bringing it to other people and, and really bringing something to other people that is useful, is, is useful and enhances their lives, um, both from the perspective of fitness and from the perspective of, you know, reinforcement and using something that's motivating for somebody to enhance other areas that we, that we want to build up. So Patrick, um, take it away, man. How, how do you <laughs> wind up here? Not, not just on this, on, on this interview, but um, the, the, culmination of your life up until the first work app <laughs> and, and, and you and I were just talking I, I for um for context right before uh we hit record here you and I were talking a little bit about our our own histories with fitness and and how we wound up to you know respect and and, and make lifestyles out of this yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for that for that wonderful intro. And uh, I think in the spirit of of kind of the the topic, I'll uh, I'll give a, a life history sort of through the lens of oh, uh, my like fitness it, journey. With that wonderful uh, intro that led to your entire life. <laughs> um, but yes, thank you, thank you so much for having me, and and I really appreciate all those those kind words. So, as Eric was saying, uh, I'm the creator of an app called First Work. Uh, First Work is a learning application or a motivation platform, kind of depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, and the way that our application works is it limits access to fun or distracting applications like YouTube until you complete important activities like learning work uh, or, in Eric's case, fitness. Uh, it's a really interesting concept and a way to kind of shift the way that we think about screen time and all of these digital distractions into a position where they can be rewards for things that are really important to bring you to be motivated to do all of that. Uh, as opposed to being something that we're always kind of trying to keep separate from the things that are important uh, for you to do. It's it's a little bit like having, you know, a, a giant TV on while you're trying to have a conversation with your partner, um, even if you're not trying to. It's, you know, just there and it's in the background. And that's kind of how screen time exists in a lot of our lives. It's it's the TV is on and it's in the living room and it's uh, it's it's 4K and it's really big. And so it's hard if you kind of have that open landscape uh, to situate screen time in your life so that you can focus on that conversation, focus on that thing that you should be doing, um, and then have, you know, kind of a place for it afterwards. So what our app does is helps you frame that uh, so that you can be really intentional about it as a parent and choose when access is going to be granted uh, so that it can be used as, as a reward. Um, I uh, got in touch with Eric a little while ago. We've met through uh, the Autism Partnership Initiative and one of the things that really struck me was I just love the mission of autism fitness. Uh, I have a background in fitness. I'm from a family of uh, fitness fanatics. Uh, I was laughing with Eric. One of the first things that I think I learned how to do was a proper push-up. Uh, it was something that was really important in my life. And I think that, uh, you know, these these communities and these conversations where we can talk about, um, you know, things that are specifically fitness related and things that are really important to fitness like motivation can be really productive. Um, I have a background in ABA as well. So I think it's really important to have these conversations and think about 
how we think about motivation and the context that we're, we're in, as well as just what specifically the goals are and what we're doing, because we can set great goals, have good plans, but if nobody's really that interested in doing what, uh, what has to be done, then of course, nothing is really going to happen. And so um, it's an important part of, I think any successful program is, is kind of thinking through all of those rewards and the motivators. Um, and so uh, it's been really exciting to be in touch with Eric uh, to kind of think more about how this could work outside of the domain of learning and um, kind of in the broader universe of uh, of all of the things that people need to do. Yeah, I, I think you you brought up a great point there also with uh, the word context and contextualizing how we can utilize different, you know, from the first work app to, to fitness because autism and neurodivergency is such a, a wide array of individuals and capabilities and challenges also. And, you know, historically when when we talk about um you know the the integration of positive behavior supports it, it's always been you know it, you've been doing this for a long time i've been doing this for a very long time you know 20 20 plus years and when i started out just be, because of the you know the science and and because of the um diagnostic mm, I, I don't know if we want to call them limitations at a time but the diagnostic scope we're looking at much more of a narrow range of capabilities and challenges. And now that's broadened significantly, sure. um, especially with the the diagnoses and, you know, level one, level two, level three autism, in addition to, um, you know, those those who are self-advocates, the, the um, individuals who are undiagnosed, but, but definitely feel that they uh, fit that criteria and, and may very well uh, also. So now you have this very wide, uh, landscape of different individuals who um, are either diagnosed or or undiagnosed, um, but all fit this general criteria of of autism spectrum or or neurodivergence. Uh, and the reason I bring that up is now we talk about motivation and reinforcement, not just from this very narrow. Uh, you know, when then, which is fine because that's the basis of contingencies, but it's going to fit in differently for everybody. You know, the, the classic kind of token board system, it still works for a, a lot of people. Again, both, uh, you know, uh, neuro uh, neurodevelopmentally different and, and, you know, neurotypical, neuroatypical, um, but it's not always going to work for for everybody. So I think systemically or from a, a, a premise, from a foundation, just about everything is when then, but it's not always this direct, you know, one-to-one -one correlation if you look at, at human behavior, because it's a little bit more complex than that sometime. So I, I think speaking about the first work app and, and motivation and reinforcement in general is not always this Sometimes it is this direct, you know, one to one ratio, but the the beauty of something that that um, the app does, I think, is that you can tailor that to an yeah. individual. As well. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that one of the things that um, it's sort of an undercurrent of, I think, all conversations about screen time is that there's sort of this multiplier effect. I think on on screen time as a reward. Um, you know, I had this this mental image a little while ago of uh, if you're familiar with the concept of a homunculus, which is uh, a, it's a depiction of a person where you can see, for instance, all the sensory uh, inputs in your body. And so your hands are really big and, you know, different parts of your body where there's lots of sensation are, are kind of overemphasized in this image. And like uh, if we think about the reinforcement landscape, I think we have we have a similar sort of thing as well, where, you know, the the screens and the things in our life that, you know, we're really drawn to just have this really outsized impact on us. Um, and so. Thinking about that in the context of reinforcement, I think is is also really important. Where um, you know a little bit of time and a little bit of access to some of these platforms, uh, you know, can be a really big draw to to kind of uh, you know encourage people to to get involved in something where something that you might think is you know a better activity but might not actually be as interesting, uh, you know, will have a little bit less of an effect. So that's I think one of the things that I'm most excited about with the concept behind the app is that. Currently, the reinforcers that are best, you know, which are the ones that kids will choose the most are pretty much always on the device. And, you know, that's sometimes an uncomfortable reality that, you know, we don't love basketball as much as we love YouTube. But in reality, that's that's what kids are going to choose a lot of the time. And without having the ability to 
kind of situate that as a reward and not a distractor, uh, it's really hard to kind of leverage the reinforcement landscape that we live in, where, you know, that's kind of how we promote growth and development for the most part is by incentivizing people to do things that are important to them. Um, and without kind of taking into account the shift in the landscape that's happened in the last little while where certain things have gotten really big, you know, and, and really important in, in life and other things have sort of by comparison become diminished, you know, your strategy, uh, you know, should at least incorporate an understanding that there's kind of a pantheon of things that people want um, and the things that are right up there, you know, kind of at the top leading edge of that are going to have a really big impact. Uh, and, you know, whether, and that's sort of whether or not you're implementing it as a reward, if it's around and it's not being used as a reward, it's kind of living as a distractor where yeah. maybe it is removing that motivation component. So um, it's a really interesting landscape that we live in today. And it's, it's interesting to see how it affects everything, uh, including things that seem like they would be a world away from your behavior uh, surrounding YouTube, things like fitness, where, you know, uh, Eric and I have had the discussion a lot about how sometimes the screen time can be a big distractor uh, and sometimes it can be a big motivator. And it really just depends a lot on how it is fit into the broader experience. Um, so we'd love to hear a little bit more about that, actually, from you, Eric, about uh, how how you've kind of encountered screen time in relationship to fitness and uh you know, the broader landscape that we're operating in. You know, what's funny about that. At first, when you were talking, I, I, I was thinking about it as, as most people do, I was guilty about thinking of, of what my next answer was going to be to that. But then the last thing I thought of was self-regulation, not just for my athletes, but for myself too. Like um, in the last year, I started using the, um, shout out to Renaissance Periodization, but I started using the RP app to to track my uh training programs and i've never prior to that i never used any type of of app for fitness i would actually mm -hmm. i have a decade's worth of notebooks where i wrote down oh, wow. my, my training oh yeah i, I was a, a training journal guy and so i started using the app and for a long time i never had my um i'm, I'm a late adopter to a lot of stuff um, on, on purpose also. Um, but I never had my music on my phone. I would have it on an actual iPod separately and I would either have it, you know, it, in my ears or I would have it on a speaker or something like that. And now in the last year, I've had my, my iPhone, um, when I train and, you know, my, my Bluetooth headset, and so I'm entering my uh, my sets, my reps, my my weight and everything in, into the app. And I notice, oh, now I'm also on my phone. So in between sets, if I'm resting like, you know, 90 seconds, two minutes, whatever it is, as I'm recovering, I'm like, I'm just going to check my email real quick. I'm like, what do I do? I got to a point where like, what am I doing? I'm And it didn't, it didn't take away from my training at all because nothing can it's very dialed in i'm always doing exactly what i need to be doing when i need to be doing it there's never i'm not going to take a call it's but i'm also noticing oh that's weird i would have never done that i wouldn't i would have never walked over to my laptop or my desktop hmm. to check my email in between sets of squat or, or sets of rows or, or push-ups or whatever i'm doing I'm like oh now because it's convenient for me and it's accessible yeah i'm doing it and it's not in this case where we're, we're, we're not talking about, you know, the toxicity level of screen time, like it's completely benign. Like there's nothing wrong with it. It's also interesting because I have the capability or the, or the option to check my email or to check something on Instagram really quick in between sets. I'm doing it. Whereas if I didn't have the option immediately available to me, I wouldn't do it. Now I think about that because the because strength training has such a high level of reinforcement for me both uh intrinsically and extrinsically i'm gonna get my workout done like i will put other things aside in order to get my my training done but that's not the case for most people so sure. for a lot of the athletes that i have um who they you know value screen time well above anything else you look at that and the you know, self-regulation or self-modulation there, if that thing's available, then they're going to take advantage of it because they don't have the same um, imbalance mm. that, that I do, whereas I'm prioritizing fitness uh, or, or the exercise at hand very, you know, very highly 
and, and you know, checking my email or checking um, Instagram down here. But for a lot of our athletes and students and clients, it's it, it's the inverse, whether we're talking about fitness or something else. So really what, um, what something like you're doing is not only, it's not just a reinforcer modulation, but it's habit forming, which is, yeah. I, I think is a really important way to look at it. It's an aid to the individual forming that habit of less screen yeah. time and more quality screen time as well, where it's not just, it's not just, you know, jump, what we would call in the training world, jump volume. Like it's yeah. just, it's just extra. They may need, and I, I say need within, again, consideration for that self-regulation or self-modulation, they may need like 30 seconds or 40 seconds of, you know, watching that YouTube video or whatever it is for that reinforcement and for that self-regulation, but they don't need four minutes of it. Yeah. And it's just kind of what, you know, what's commonly referred to as doom scrolling. In yeah, way. totally. Yeah. And I think there's, there's so much really interesting to, to pick up on there. And one, one thing that really stood out to me is the way that you kind of ended up in that position where your reinforcers were stacked the way that they were. And I think, you know, habits and consistency are the answer to that, where one thing that's really interesting about, you know, your fitness journey when you're younger is that on top of, you know, like the actual physical development that you're doing, you're also developing, you know, these important habits uh, that will hopefully stick with you for your whole life and can really lead to lots of benefits and longevity. Um, but these things don't come, don't come quickly. They don't come cheap. And, uh, you know, we're, you just mentioned you had 10 years of, uh, 10 years of journals, you know, uh, filled out yeah. regularly. And I'm sure there's plenty before that as well. So, you know, in order to get to a place where you have that self-regulatory capacity, where you kind of have set up the weights and measures so that the positive impact on your life, you know, kind of gives you the reward that is really commensurate with that value. You know, it takes a lot of shaping of behavior and consistency over, you know, sometimes decades. Um, and so I think that it's a really important kind of kind of component to mention, too, that on top of, you know, maybe promoting a more successful session today, um, it could also be, you know, important to be thinking about it from the lens of habit development, where, you know, if the if the habit is um, that, you know, there's there's too much reliance on a specific contingency um, or, you know, there's the, this this big distractor that's always winning. You know, if you're not having that experience that's, you know, kind of conducive to building that that positive habit, um, you know, you could be working positively in one direction and a little bit negatively in another. So it is really important, I think, to think about uh, think about it through the lens of habit formation, because that's really totally. where you go. Yeah. And, and looking at it, you know, from a historical perspective, you know, it and 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 setting aside judgment just for the analysis of okay what's going on right now like you see someone in the gym who doesn't look like they're in the best shape and then you know you speak to someone on the side and they say yeah they you know they lost 80 pounds like they've been training like oh, okay that get, you know that's yeah. going to give you a completely different framework um even in my own you know in my own um i'm not going to word use the term journey because i just overplayed at this point but historically <laughs> so i started out as a kid who played a lot of sports and then i stopped and then i got you know unhealthily over like really overweight and that's when i found you know training and and martial arts and just you know lifting and that's how i got into it but i was starting at, at a deficit i first got had to get to the point where i was you know for me i you know at, at at a, a healthy weight and moving mm. on a regular basis and eating better food. So for me, the I I I started from a point early on in in my adolescence where there was that that inversion of a higher reinforcement being you know food for mm. me ab absolutely um and being sedentary and then switching that around somewhere um you know between like my junior year and high in high school somewhere around seventeen or or eighteen years old. But for me, that switch was fairly, fairly quick. It also happened at an opportune time when, you know, when you have the metabolism of, of an average 18 year old, yeah. you can drop 40 pounds, yeah. in, you know, in like eight months, which is great, but that becomes more and more difficult. You know, it's that not impossible at all, but definitely sure. more difficult as the timeline goes on. Um, so I, I think that there is something also to take into account where in, in, autism fitness program we uh, our first mantra of the of the approach is meet the athlete where they're at 
Yeah. And that means physically, adaptively, and cognitively, and and considering the motivation. Um, it's also environmentally contingent as well, because when a parent says, oh, you know, they need to work out or they've never worked out. All right, well, let's bring them into an environment that's more conducive mm -hmm. to a good experience yeah, uh, totally. for that as well. So when you're in, you know, it, when you're in just a, you know, a, a stainless steel room that ha that has nothing in it, of course, anything is going to be more stimulating than that. Yeah. So it's going to have a much higher rate of reinforcement. But one of the things that we do through through fitness and one of the things that i've I, I i have found and that's been replicated by you know so many of our our certified coaches is that when you give the opportunity for an individual to succeed with fitness the balancing out of the the re, the the power of reinforcers starts to happen relatively quickly so whereas it used to be highly aversive to engage in that fitness activity you see three four five six weeks later sometimes longer but they yeah, start to take out you know by being and, and another thing that i'd love you to talk about also is that pairing effect as well when you're pairing something that is less preferred with something that is more preferred um there there is generally a positive effect towards the thing that is less preferred as well yeah no absolutely it's um you know that's that's one of the kind of core principles of, of behavioral science that we see, you know, sort of everywhere uh, in the world is that, uh, you know, if we provide a, you know, a, a good pairing, um, you can kind of associate the desire to do the the latter with with the former, uh, they become, you know, sort of simpatico in a certain way. And uh, we can all think of experiences in our own life where we had to, you know, go, go do x and we also did y and that's what made x okay. Yep. And, you know, for me, it was, uh, I hated to get shots when I was a kid. So I would go with my grandma, who was always a really comforting figure for me, and she would, uh, you know, say that we'd go get ice cream afterwards, which probably on the fitness uh, fitness podcast not necessarily the greatest reinforcer. But regardless, just a just a joke there. But um, you know, that's that's sort of how we can uh, create situations where you're a little bit more comfortable with, and there's a little bit more incentive to do whatever it is. And you know, there's a, uh, and I think there's a lot to be said about how you know when, especially with something like fitness, with something really anything. Um, it's a big ask to try something for the first time when you've never done it. And it's, it's physically difficult. You know, we've, uh, if you've been in the gym, you've felt that uh, soreness and that not so certain and, and also just doing new things. It's, it's overwhelming. You don't quite know what the motion looks like. You know, you might make a mistake. You might be corrected, uh, yeah. you know, as, as you should, because it's just because of safety, but there's just a lot that goes into, to new things, especially. So, you know, being able to have a pairing and having it be something that, that people really care about um, can really be an important way to create avenues to introduce new things. Um, and, you know, it's not to say that that net pairing needs to be there forever, uh, that it needs to be the real thing that's driving you to to be engaged in that over time. Like, uh, you know, usually the goal is to develop some internal motivation to start having more of a fun time with it, which kind of is what you were saying before, where, you know, after a few weeks, you sort of realize like, hey, I kind of like kind of yeah. like this activity. I kind of like hanging out at the gym. I kind of like, you know, seeing the people I see there or, you know, whatever it is that you enjoy about it. Um, and then suddenly there isn't as much need for external motivation because, you know, you have a little bit more steam on your own, which is really the goal, but it could be a really nice catalyst to, to think, you know, to think about what, what sort of pairing, um, you know, could help create those opportunities for those first engagements and, uh, make engagements, you know, kind of consistent and fun over time. Um, so whether it be, you know, uh, it doesn't really matter what it is. It's, uh, I think something just like important to think about, um, you know, in the context of, of whoever you're thinking about, uh, you know, what are those things they really care about? And uh, is there a way to kind of combine those with things that are really important to do to create an environment where, you know, there can be an opportunity for those important things to take on a life of their own and be, you know, get get some of their own steam. Um, so, yeah, it's love behavioral science. And I think there's uh, there's so much to it for 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 practitioners and parents and, and really everybody else. And what we're talking about, you know, engaging in different reinforcing behaviors also I'm, I'm glad you brought up the ice cream thing because i have a, i think i have a good place to to go with that also you know sometimes it's not about or oftentimes it's not about eliminating the you know the behavior of the reinforcer entirely like something like smoking yeah probably um, not the best <laughs> you know, probably yeah but because of, you know the the benefit to arm ratio but so you bring up ice cream right and and i'll i'll take something from from my own history also when I was like a, a nine or 10 year old 
kid, when I was more more sedentary or putting on a lot of weight, I would probably think about that all day. Like I'd be thinking about the ice cream in the freezer all, you know, all day and perseverating on that. Um, you know, now, and I, I, I'm not a, a big dessert person either. Mm-hmm. I always take salt over sugar, but oh, anyway, too. so my wife and I are out here um, on the, on the coast in North Carolina. And we discovered this little spot that makes the best, like it's a little like micro cream, oh, like a small batch ice place. cream. Oh my goodness. Yeah, and, and and they have non-dairy stuff too. I can't oh, that's there. so cool. Yeah. So they do the best non-dairy like awesome. I've ever had. And so now, you know, when we're out here every couple of weeks, oh, uh, you know, we'll go to the gym and then I go to, you know, jujitsu class. And so I've put in a lot. It's like, okay, let's go get, you know, let, let's go over to, to the spot, to Scoops. Uh, shout out to Scoops Micro Creamery over in, um, in, uh, t- uh, Topsail, uh, no, it's, it's Sneets Ferry, um, <laughs> uh, North Carolina. And, uh, maybe I'll, maybe I'll get half off a scoop, but you know, go there. I get the too. smallest cup. It's fantastic. And that's it. But my whole day is not based around, oh man, I'm going to get that cup of ice. It's like, okay, I'm going to go to the gym. And then afterwards, and we take the dogs and they get the pup cups and we do all, you know, like that, do all the modern things, uh, that you do, you know, you get your, your dog's ice cream and everything, but it's more part of it. It's more tied to the experience than it is the thing itself. And I think the same thing is true of screen time also. Like it's not in and of itself. It's not this toxic thing. We just want to broaden the, um, the array of reinforcers or experiences that an individual has that they can be attuned to and, and that can, um, enhance their lives versus we just have this one thing, because I've also seen, um, with a lot of the, the, athletes I've had historically who have really challenging profiles, but there's this one reliable reinforcer. Um, There's one day and it almost inevitably happens with each individual one day where that all of a sudden isn't the reinforcer. And now we're like, okay, we're back at zero because we don't have this thing. They've satiated, which is part of human growth too. Like the thing that used to have a very high degree of reinforcing power one day, you're just like, eh, yeah, no, it happens. It happens to all of us at some point. So yeah. I, I think that's that's a big component of it. Also, is expanding someone's um, reinforcement repertoire. Totally. Of they like. Yeah, no, I think that's a that's a, a super valid point because you know, like you're saying, it's it's not it's not good and it's not sustainable in the long term to be super super reliant on on just one reinforcer. Um, and I think something that you mentioned there too, which I think is an interesting point to bring up and and really any discussion about uh, that involves screen time is that I think something that is often kind of lost in the conversations is that there's so much nuance in what specifically you're doing on the device, you know, and, and where, and how that affects the function of the behavior where it's like, uh, you know, often we think about screen time and we think it's one thing, but when you look at your iPhone, there's 40 different apps on there and they all do different things for you. Um, And so it's really important to think about, that as well, you know, it's uh, what is the function of this? Uh, is this an experience that has some positive elements to it? Or is it just, you know, developmentally, you know, irrelevant? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's a, a really interesting component to bring up, you know, in, in the broader discussion as well is that, you know, just because something is a is a reinforcer and has a big draw doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, axing it out of, of the life is, is a great approach. Similarly, you know, you don't want to go all the way on the other side and just like tune into that thing 100% and really over rely on that as a behavior shaping tool. Um, So it's important to approach these things with balance. But I think uh, I really like the idea of, you know, being cognizant of of specifically what what is happening on the device and and whether or not that's, you know, a a productive behavior or less productive behavior. Are there some positive elements to it? Yeah, even even within the same type of experience, like uh, if you're watching, you know, kind of like a ten contemporary YouTube video oriented towards kids, a lot of the time those are just made for entertainment purposes. Like they're meant to be zany and wild and things that kids will enjoy. It's just uh, it's one clip after another. It's just it's, one, and it's just little, and it's and then the algorithm is set up so that you watch the yeah, next. Yeah. One. So there are things like that where it's it's quite you know um, it's it's overly reinforcing perhaps, and there's really very little value being provided. But then on the other hand, there are other video based experiences where you know there's uh, like PBS Kids, for instance, has a great app. Uh, and every video in there is teaching something in some way. Um, you know, you might be consolidating that, you might be not be, 
there are even other versions where there are like quizzes involved or, you know, tools like first work where there's, uh, you know, kind of learning incorporated into those more overly reinforcing experiences if, you know, the, the medium ones are less appealing. So just something general to, to think about, I think, is that, uh, you know, the specific function of the behavior um, and what exactly is happening and why it's happening, uh, you know, it, it are really just as important as specifically what is happening. And if we kind of just only get to that level of analysis of, you know, we ate ice cream after working out, that doesn't sound that reasonable, um, you know, then right. you might miss a lot of the point where maybe that's, you know, something that actually is really driving the whole experience for everybody and right. uh, can, can be really important. So yeah. all, all conversations about behavior end up getting kind of funny and complicated, but uh, who would have thought that, uh, you know, ice cream as a reinforcer. Um. <laughs> well, yeah. And it's also the experiential too. Yeah. It just, oh, we found this great ice cream, you know, yeah. at, at the supermarket, like Publix or, you know, Harris Teeter. It's like, would I go, you know, after like, eh, probably not. I probably wouldn't go, but it's, you know, being, it's a combinatorial, spot, effect, you know, yeah. meeting the owners, hanging out with the dogs and like, it, it's, it's the whole environmental yeah. component of it, which, if you look at the research around habits, it, it, some of the stickiest habits also, it's about the the environment yeah, around totally. it too, and not just the transaction or the the, the reinforcer itself. But the, I think you, you made the point also, you know, going to the gym and having that social experience and, you yeah. know, just think there are people at, at the gym here who, I don't know their names, but, you know, you give the- Oh, yeah, you give them the, the respect, respect, you know. <laughs> and you just give the head nod, and like, that's it, and that- that yeah you know, from a social perspective is enough. Like that's, oh, yeah, that's means, community. That's, that's meaningful. Be, but it, but it's part of the whole. Yeah. The whole, thing. like you're looking yeah. at these little elements that someone said, yeah, how is a head nod possibly reinforcing, but it's part of a whole, you know, you yeah. can't. And I think there's definitely something to the environmental uh, factor of that. Also, I, do you remember how <laughs> to take it back to, to food? Do you remember they're still around too? Um, Lickamade, which were the little pow powdered sugar patches, and then it had patch uh, pa pouches, and then it had a stick made out of like solidified sugar. Oh yes, yes, of course, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's the when I see those video the the videos for kids that are just like one clip after another. Yeah, that is my food equivalent. Yeah, it is like yeah, that. It's yeah. like you're dipping a stick made of sugar into powdered sugar. Yeah, <laughs> that is the <laughs> nutritional value. Yeah, of this. But to your point, you know, making it more educational and and when someone needs that, I would never say, you know, for one of my athletes, if they, I've seen some videos where there's there was one called everything at once hmm. and it was like a landscape of boxes of every episode i forget what show it was some cartoon every episode all playing at once playing at once and wow. i had an athlete who pulled it up on youtube and he's watching it in between sets and i'm looking at it like i don't i understand what this is yeah. but i don't understand why yeah, that's I've never heard of that. That's that's something else. It it one hundred percent it was the the sensory input. Oh, yeah, like I'm there sure. was something about this cacaf this wall of sound <laughs> that it was that the yeah. you know the, the overwhelm was the was the exact stimulus that he needed. But I can't help but think at some point he's probably gonna satiate that to like yeah. um that was, you know, I was working with him. He was fifteen. That's probably not going to be the same reinforcer when he's sure. there. But very, very unlikely. But if we can use that as kind of a springboard to, oh, here's some other stuff that, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. not necessarily, you know, going from that to like a PBS. Thing. Sure. Yeah, like, that might not be reasonable. Kind of having this gradient scale of entertainment that has a little bit more value, and I think that's what you were alluding to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of you know being conscientious about the the time that's spent you know on these experiences and thinking about the corollary i think that that's the way that i always kind of like to frame these thoughts where if you go back 30 40 years um where you know all of this technology was not not even on the radar uh, in a lot of cases um you know people were spending that time at that age very differently there was a kind of a basic level of development that was happening in all sorts of experiences because of, you know, outdoor play and 
uh, siblings and just being bored and just all of all of these things that that uh, would be part of a typical childhood in that era. And if we're trading that in, which we kind of are in a lot of cases for about eight hours a day for you know this this entertainment time, it's really critical to kind of do the comparison of you know, are we getting anywhere close to what we probably might have learned in that context? And, you know, maybe the answer is, is no, that in that time, you know, there's a lot less development happening. And there's other periods of time in the day where there's more. But regardless, it's, it's a huge amount of time. It's about 35,000 hours before kids are 18 will be spent on on devices. And so, you know, that's enough time to you know, run around the circumference of the earth a few times uh, at a pretty reasonable pace. Uh, you can do all sorts of things at that time. So that's just yeah. land mass or is that water as well? I think you'd have to be walking on water, which would be the impressive part uh, to, to, to do the whole Pacific Ocean and just uh, get into theology. Now, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You got to get a really nice lead up. If you just start running at the Sierras and pick up speed until you get to the Pacific, you can usually make it to Japan. Um, but um, that's <laughs> But but regardless, it's I think um, you know one of my kind of personal missions is to is to speak more about and then kind of uh, think more about how that time is spent and if there's ways that uh, it can be made more development developmentally relevant for for people. Um, yeah, and, and and that you know bringing it back to first work also that's one of the things that I really appreciate about it is that it can be this this lead in towards healthier habit formation. Yeah. And it's not about the elimination. We're not going to eliminate social media. We're not going to eliminate um, screen time entirely. It's making it healthier. You know, yeah. it's not, it's not going away. And we don't want, we don't want to embrace the opposite extreme. You know, when, when yeah. people go into, oh no, we've got to get back to like primal lives. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, yeah, well, you know, primal lives also had disease and cockroach infestations that you couldn't fight with any type of chemical. So yeah, enjoy, that. <laughs> enjoy, have yeah. fun. Um, you want primal honey? Okay, you go to a beehive. Yeah, go grab it. Enjoy, <laughs> yeah. have fun with that. Um, but it's about incorporating it in a way that is more conducive to, I think, general uh, healthier habits and uh, again I, I, I at the risk of um or at the fault of being redundant having more options towards things that are um that that are not only reinforcing but that are you know are are, are building a bigger better life for yeah some. and i i think that one of the ways that you and i coincide here is that there's a great deal of respect for the neurodivergent population in that where someone is now is not their full potential. Oh, absolutely. And in order to do that, in order to realize that full potential, we need to incorporate some tools and practices uh, and support so that we know, so we know that they have these options. So yeah. That we know that those capabilities can be more realized because otherwise if we just if we assume or if we say well they're doing this now so this is okay so this is the way it can be for the future that's not providing them with that's not providing them with the pathway to growing developing and having a better life yeah no I absolutely agree with that i think that's uh you know what the way i like to think about it is uh you know you can we're all a part of the environment that everybody else lives in. And, you know, some of us can kind of, uh, be, be a part of, you know, the environment helping you. Uh, it's, you know, if you think about your, you know, your house, there's all sorts of things inside the house that help you do things that are important. And if it wasn't there, your life would be a little bit harder. Uh, and that's a bummer. And if your life is a little bit harder, you know, you might make less progress and it's just more difficult. Um, so I, I really respect the the work that you do at, at autism fitness in that respect, where I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's such an underappreciated component of, of every flourishing life is, you know, kind of, uh, you know, having good physical fitness. It's just, you know, any, any research study you can look at, it's going to tell you that's one of the most important things, if not the most important thing. So being a part of that environment that kind of uh, points you towards the gym and, you know, kind of once you're there can help be an encourager and, uh, you know, a shaper to make sure things are safe and, uh, and, and productive. 
uh, is super important work. And so, yeah, love, love that we have that, uh, that in common, trying to be a, a goalpost towards better things in the environment. Um, and, you know, maybe don't go over there as much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, likewise. So, and, it, and, you know, with, with first work and with what you're doing also, it's, you know, anybody who has an iPhone, I'm, I'm sure it's similar with uh, Android, you know, you're getting your screen time update every oh, week. Yeah. And someone who looks at their screen time and they're like, you're, you know, you are on an average of, you know, five and a half hours a day last week. Nobody's going to look at that and say, yeah, that, you know, that's, that, that's fine. But, and again, we're talking about the, the neuro, most of the neurotypical population right now. Okay, great. You have the information. What are you going to do about it? Right. Yeah. Which is always, I think the the catalyst towards either innovation or behavior change is, okay, yeah. we know this, what are we going to do? Yeah. What are we going to do about, about that? It? Yeah. Like, it, you know, in, in my case with autism fitness, it's okay. We know that there's a, a crisis of inactivity. What are we going to do about it? And what are the, what are the structures that we needed to put into place to make strength and conditioning uh, part of the lives of the, the autism and neurodivergent population? In your case, it's okay. We know that there's too much screen time, like guaranteed, guaranteed, but we still we still want there to be screen time. We we just need to make it work better for everybody involved. Because if uh, you know a professional or a parent or a family member can't implement some type of life skill program or can't, mm, that's not conducive to to them being able to to um, to benefit that individual. And if that individual again doesn't doesn't have that habit formation component, then they're unlikely to make that change on their own. In many yeah. cases, yeah, absolutely. Well, well, I really appreciate the uh, the kind words there. It's uh, two people on a mission, uh, trying trying to trying to get something uh, something positive in the world. Oh, is that a horrible name for a podcast? Two men on a mission. <laughs> oh man, I I appreciate this. I know we we've, we've been trying to set this up for quite some time. Um, so I th I think we'll we'll end it here for now. But I definitely want to do more of these. Um, Patrick, where can people find you and and the first workout? Yeah, if you want to take a look at uh, at what we built, uh, you can find us online at www.firstworkapp.com. Uh, we have a lot of information about the uh, the application and how it works there. You can also search First Work on Android or on iOS, uh, and the application will pop right up there, where you can download it on your mobile device, uh, so for phones and for tablets. Uh, so, yeah, would love to would love to see you all around the around. Yep, and I'm going to put a link to that in the description here. Um, as always, autismfitness.com for certification consulting and all things autism fitness. Uh, I, I'd love to know, um, in the comments, what, uh, what people have gotten from this conversation, because I, I think this was a really good one. Um, and definitely a departure from me speaking directly at the screen, just <laughs> myself. Uh, I, I appreciate the second voice here, as, especially when it's, uh, educated and dedicated as you are. So Patrick, thank you again, man. And uh, we'll, we'll do this at another time also. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Eric. And uh, wonderful to, to be here. Really appreciate it.